This video is about the wide toe shoe and its impact on the distribution of pressure, the orientation of the digital bones, and the process of placing the hoof. The data presented here was raised by a scientific cooperation between Workman and the Institute of Veterinary Anatomy, Leipzig. The wide toe shoe is a modification regarding the dorso palmer level. In this case, the horseshoe's toe is widened and the branches are narrowed down. The branch's tips are grinded on the side facing the ground. This reduces the supporting surface from toe to heel. In addition, the supporting surface for the hoof is larger than the area actually touching the ground. The manufacturing of a wide toe shoe is demonstrated by Mitch Taylor in the corresponding video. The wide toe shoe is a therapeutic shoe which is used in tendomyopathies of the suspensory ligaments and illnesses of the superficial flexor tendon and its supportive ligament. Additional indications are desmopathies of the sesamoidean ligaments, which constitute the lower part of the suspensory ligaments. The structures indicated here are subject to considerable biomechanic stress, so that injuries in these areas are especially common, the reason being the orientation of the equine digital bones. One of the peculiarities of the equine distal extremity is the hyperextension of the fetlock joint. Especially during motion and under stress, as generated by jumping, for example, the head of the cannon bone descends. This hyperextension is being kept in check by the suspensory ligaments, which, consisting of several structures, ensure an elastic stability. Here we take a closer look at the equine suspensory ligaments in order to better understand the discussed illnesses and the way the wide toe shoe works. This structure consists of several different elements. The M. interosseus medius is of paramount importance for the functionality. It arises as a tendon from the third metacarpal bone or cannon bone and continues on between the second and fourth metacarpal bone as a sinewy plane. Further along, the M. interosseus splits into two branches, which attach to the proximal sesamoids. In addition, there is a supplementary branch on either side, which inserts in the digital extensor tendon. The superficial digital flexor tendon provides additional stability. It attaches the superficial digital flexor to the short pastern bone. Distal to the fetlock, the sesamoidian ligaments, especially the straight and the two oblique ones, work towards fixating the fetlock joint. During the weight-bearing part of the footfall, the deep digital flexor tendon has a stabilizing function as well. With regard to the biomechanic effects of the wide toe shoe, we first discuss the impact on the orientation of the digital bones. The radiological examinations of the toe were carried out with a digital system by Geareth X-Ray International and a wireless detector by Canon. For the examination, the horse was placed so that both forelegs stood parallel on even ground in the most natural position achievable. This was in order to obtain reproducible radiographs, which enabled us to compare the alignment of the digital bones of five horses when shod with different shoes. As measurements were supposed to be taken in the radiographs, we used a special X-ray block by Eponitech. This block is specially fabricated with internal reference points enabling the subsequent calibration in Metron hoof software. In order to evaluate the shoe's effects on different grounds, we modified the X-ray block so that either a wooden board or a silicon pad plus sand could be attached to the upper side. Thereby, the shoe's properties on firm as well as soft ground could be evaluated. When taking standardized radiographs, it is essential to introduce a permanent and correct mark on which the X-ray beam can be centered. In this case, the center of the frog and the widest part of the hoof were used as the reference to apply the marks after trimming. The central ray aimed at the solar margin. Using this technique, we obtained a lateral and frontal image, each on firm and soft ground of the respective hoof. Now we explain the wide toe shoe's influence on the mediolateral orientation of the coffin bone in relation to the ground. The barefoot situation, as well as the usage of standard horseshoes in five horses, serve as a comparison. Every radiographic examination was carried out on a firm wooden block and a block with soft padding, 
in order to capture the effects of the shoes on the orientation of the digital bones on different types of ground. When taking the mediolateral orientation of the coffin bone into account, we see that a wide-toe shoe has neither an influence on firm nor on soft ground when compared to unshod horses or standard shoes. The coffin bone's position remains impartial to the type of shoe. However, there are variations due to the different kinds of ground irrespective of the usage of a wide-toe shoe. As a rule, the mediolateral orientation of the coffin bone alters from firm to soft ground. On soft ground, the, according to the build, heavily loaded part of the hoof can sink in, causing the angle of the coffin bone in relation to the ground to change. The following images illustrate this. The dorsopalmar alignment of the coffin bone is heavily influenced by a wide toe shoe. The same references as mentioned before were consulted for assessing the palmar angle of the coffin bone in relation to the ground, and all measurements were carried out on both types of ground. Usage of the firm x-ray block shows no differences between unshod, standard shoe, and wide toe shoe, as only the surface is modified. However, if sinking into the ground is possible, we discover that the palmar angle of the coffin bone becomes smaller compared to barefoot or standard shoe. The coffin bone's alignment becomes planar. As the supported tiptoe can't sink in the way it does barefoot or when shod with a standard shoe, and because the branches tend to sink in more easily, the orientation of the hoof as well as the distal digital bone flattens. Strikingly, the coffin bone's angle isn't flatter on soft ground than on a firm surface, resulting in a steady orientation of the coffin bone. So the corresponding structures are loaded and relieved evenly on all kinds of ground. The toe-to-support ratio is of fundamental biomechanic importance. As a starting point, the identification of the rotational center of that part of the short pastern bone which constitutes the coffin joint has been established. Beginning at that point, a perpendicular is dropped, which divides the sole of the hoof into a supporting part, lying heelward, and a lever arm continuing toeward to the point of breakover. The size of the lever arm is bigger the longer the toe is. This parameter can be altered by moving the point of breakover forwards or backwards, or by changing the dorsopalmar orientation of the hoof, too. It is crucial, however, that the longer the toeward lever arm, the more stress for the deep digital flexor tendon and the navicular bursa. The important toe-to-support ratio isn't influenced by the wide toe shoe on firm ground in any considerable way. Only the grinding of the branch's tips reduces the supporting area by a fraction, modifying the ratio in favor of the toe. On firm ground, this effect can be neglected, though. It is interesting to see, however, how the leverage forces influence the orientation of the hoof on soft ground. It is quite obvious that the toe sinks deeper into the ground when a standard shoe is being used than when the horse is shod with a wide toe shoe. Thereby, the hoof and the coffin bone become flatter in relation to the ground with a wide toe shoe. From putting the rotational center in relation to the point of breakover and the branches tips results the anterior lever arm over which the horse has to unroll and the posterior lever arm which influences the placing of the hoof. The ratio of anterior to posterior lever arm determines the tension on the deep digital flexor tendon. Its onset is located at the palmar surface of the coffin bone, and this strong tendon changes its direction when passing the navicular bursa. When we transfer the situation with a standard shoe on soft ground, depicted by the narrow lines, to the hoof shod with a wide toe shoe, we see the following. As the hoof's orientation is flatter, the point of breakover moves forward, and the anterior lever arm becomes longer. This changes the course of the deep digital flexor tendon, causing more strain on soft ground even when the horse isn't moving. Apart from that, this structure is stressed more during unrollment because of the elongation of the anterior lever arm. In conclusion, the wide toe shoe has significant influence on the dynamics and biomechanics of the course of motion.
Every horseshoe influences the way pressure forces are distributed across the hoof capsule, apart from their effects on bones, tendons, and ligaments. Here we demonstrate what kind of ground reaction forces develop between shoe and ground and how they are relayed to the hoof capsule. For this purpose, two pressure sensors by Megascan were simultaneously fixed to the hoof. Both forelimbs were shod and the left one used for measurements in each case. Five horses were available and the barefoot situation, as well as a standard shoe, served as reference. As the sensor foils are very thin, one could be fastened with two nails between shoe and hoof and another one with tape between shoe and ground. All the measurements were carried out on a straight trail consisting of concrete, a rubber mat, and firm and deep sand, because the effect of different shoes is very much dependent on the condition of the ground. The following parameters are of importance for the evaluation of the pressure measurements. The intensity of the pressure forces is color-coded with red illustrating pressure peaks, or maximum pressure, and orange, yellow, green, light blue, and dark blue signifying decreasing pressure. Furthermore, we look at the position of the center of force, which is indicated by a black and white box while standing or during the main stance phase. In order to evaluate the distribution pattern of the resulting pressure, the hoof is divided into the following parts, and the stress in percent for different shoes is given. Apart from that, the hoof can be divided into a lateral and medial and an anterior and posterior half. First, we look at those pressure forces which develop between shoe and firm ground, here concrete, during walking. A standard shoe with a rolled toe and a toe cap is compared to the wide toe shoe. The standard shoe creates a typical picture with a broad supporting surface and pressure peaks in the toe area. The pressure distribution pattern of the wide toe shoe stands out clearly. Because of the larger toe surface, more pressure lies on this area, which is distributed more evenly, however. As the wide toe shoe's branches are narrower, there's less surface available to take on the pressure, resulting in less strain on this part on the one hand, but producing pressure peaks on the other hand. We see a similar tendency when we look at the branch's tips, where there are distinct pressure peaks in comparison to the relatively broad branches of a standard shoe. So how does the shape of the shoe and the resulting pressure distribution pattern influence the hoof capsule while walking? We can see that the pressure is passed on from the shoe to the hoof on firm ground. The strain on the toe caused by pressure is significantly bigger whereas a considerably larger part of the sole actually carries weight. The strain on the lateral walls, however, almost remains the same. The supporting surface at the toes is smaller in comparison to a standard shoe, so that pressure peaks occur. The wide toe shoe displays its real effect on soft ground, which allows different parts of the hoof to sink in. Here, too, the standard shoe with a rolled toe is used for comparison. When the shod hoof sinks in to its full extent, the entire frog and sole bear weight. The shoe is clearly visible as a thin light blue to green line from toe to heels because it is there that the pressure is at its maximum. Looking at the pressure distribution patterns of a wide toe shoe in deep sand while walking, the following becomes apparent. The wide toe, which prevents the anterior part of the hoof from sinking into the ground, causes an increased counterpressure in this area. The narrow branches of the wide toe shoe, however, facilitate the hoof to sink into the ground easily without much resistance. This is why there are less pressure peaks in this area in comparison to a standard shoe. This sheet concerns itself with the extent to which the pressure forces are projected from the shoe onto the hoof capsule while walking. It becomes evident that the toe is under a lot of stress. This results from the widened toe of the wide toe shoe which reduces the way the toe can sink into the ground and thereby increases the resistance. The middle part of the hoof, however, is included to a greater extent in bearing the weight. The narrow branches of the wide toe shoe sink into the soft ground more easily, causing the palmer part of the hoof to sink deeper into the sand. So a considerably larger part of the posterior half of the hoof carries weight compared to a horse shod with a standard shoe. 
The grinded tips of the branches sink into the ground as easily as the branches themselves. Therefore, there are less pressure peaks in the heel area, and the frog carries weight as well. In conclusion, the wide toe shoe reveals its effects especially on soft ground. Compared to a standard shoe, there are significant differences in the pressure distribution pattern. A standard shoe stresses the toe and the heels most, whereas the lateral walls are under less pressure. When the horse is shod with a wide toe shoe, the hoof capsule is exposed to a lot more pressure. Apart from that, the area in the center part of the hoof, which is used to carry weight, is larger, so that the strain on the palmer half of the foot is bigger. On soft ground, which facilitates sinking in, the heels are subject to far less pressure forces. Between shoe and hoof capsule, the different shoes cause differing amounts of stress to which we have to pay attention when using a wide toe shoe for therapeutic purposes. Particularly, the significantly larger strain on the posterior part of the hoof has to be taken into account. In general, the size of the weight-bearing surface and the counter-pressure of the ground influence the pressure distribution pattern the most. This example shows that the same pressure forces per cent affect the anterior and posterior half of the hoof, but the size of the area which is subject to those forces differs. For the footing pattern is formed out of several steady steps, which are averaged into one picture, so that it shows the migration of the center of force during the main stance phase. For that purpose, the horses were led along a straight line on the different types of ground without distraction or lateral movements of the head. One take was 10 seconds long with 100 pictures taken per second. During the subsequent analysis with the hoof software by Megascan, the first and last step of each take were discarded so that six to seven stable steps could be evaluated. The averaged picture shows the footing, the movement during the main stance phase, the unrollment, and the point of breakover. When we compare the footing pattern with a standard shoe to the one with a wide toe shoe, there is no effect on the individual footing pattern by this modification, as these three examples show. When regarding the footing pattern on the different types of ground, we see that the individual footing on firm ground, in this case starting laterally and moving on to the lateral part of the toe, seems very distinct. The more the hoof can sink into the ground, however, the more evenly the pressure is distributed and the footing pattern becomes plainer. Even on soft ground, the wide toe shoe has no effect on the main stance phase. Summing up, the hoof with a wide toe shoe doesn't sink into the ground as much with its anterior part because of the wide toe, whereas the heels tend to sink in more easily. So hoof and coffin bone become flatter in relation to the ground in comparison to the situation with a standard shoe. Based on the biomechanical assumptions of other study groups like Denoy et al., this causes the upper toe bones to straighten up. The positive effect of the smaller coffin bone angle is the impact it has on the suspensory ligaments consisting of the superficial digital flexor tendon, the M. interosseus medius and its supportive ligament, and the sesamoidian ligaments. The increasing strain on the deep digital flexor tendon on soft ground, however, is problematic, especially during unrollment. The described effects on the alignment of the upper toe bones seems to be highly dependent on the individual conformation of the toe and the whole limb. In addition, examining radiographs can only ever be a static snapshot, leaving questions about the evaluation of biomechanic effects and the resulting dynamic processes unanswered. Special examinations regarding this point will follow. It is important to remember the wide toe shoe's effect on the palmer part of the hoof on soft ground caused by the change in the alignment of the digital bones and the change in pressure distribution. The digital bones and the hoof cartilage are joined together by a complex set of ligaments which is also affected by the use of a wide toe shoe. When using a shoe modification like this, usually the effects on tendons, ligaments, bones and cartilage or the modification of dynamic processes are at the center of attention. Often the impact on the surrounding hoof capsule takes a back seat. By changing the pressure distribution and the supporting surface, we influence the sensitive blood circulation and the horn architecture significantly.
On the whole, all the anatomic structures forming the distal extremity form a close regional and functional relationship. It is safe to assume that relief for one structure causes additional strain on the counterpart so that the efficacy of a shoe modification has to be evaluated individually in every case. Many thanks to all our assistants, and thank you very much for your attention.